Hello, uh, my name is uh, Laurent Bedoussac. I'm uh, an associate professor at uh, NCA Toulouse, working at uh, INRAE uh, in the uh, south of France. So I'm going to uh, make a talk about intercropping uh, cereal and grain legumes with a special topic on the, the supply chain challenges from a field plate. So this work has been carried out by many uh, colleagues from uh, different uh, organization and uh, research groups. So before starting on uh, this topic, it's important to have a clear definition about what we are going to talk about. So we can define uh, intercropping or crop mixture as a simultaneous cultivation of at least two species on the same area and for a significant period of time. Uh, intercrop must be seen as a practical application of ecology principles in order to enhance uh, natural resource use and uh, regulation of biotic factors. This definition covers a wide range of uh, crop mixtures. It can be annual crop mixtures like cereals and legumes, but also multi-species uh, meadows, agroforestry, which is a combination of trees production and crop production, or a trees mixture like banana and coffee in this uh, picture. In this talk, I am mostly going to focus on annual mixtures and more precisely on cereal legumes intercrops. So, as you have seen in the previous talks, uh, intercrops are uh, known to have a lot of advantages, and uh, among them, one is uh, the idea of uh, cropping mixtures can improve yield and grain quality. On the left uh, figures, we represent the intercrop, total intercrop grain yield as a function of the mean soil crop grain yield. And this data has been obtained from uh, 10 years experiments uh, in uh, different places, south of France, northwest France and Denmark, with uh, durum wheat, soft wheat, barley, intercrop with baba bean and peas, and all in organic farming production. In such condition, not because it is organic, but it is because it is low nitrogen input systems, we observe that we, in most of the situation, we have a total grain yield of the intercrop is higher than that of the mean soil crop. So this means for the farmer, it's more interesting to have one hectare of intercrops instead of one hectare divided into the cereals and the legume. Improving the yield is uh, due to the complementarity between species for light use, nitrogen use, and other resources. And improving yield is important, but also what is important it is the quality. And uh, when I talk about quality, I mean the grain protein content of the cereal. In the figure on the right part, we have the cereal grain protein content in intercrop as a mixture of the cereal grain protein content in the soil crop, grown in exactly the same conditions. Like what we observed for the grain yield, we observed here that in all the situation, we have an increase in the cereal grain protein concentration in the intercrop. This is due to the fact that when we grow a cereal with a legume, the legume is um, is using mostly the nitrogen, only nitrogen from the hair. So this means it uh, leaves all the soil nitrogen available for the cereal. But at the same time, there is competition between the two plants. So the legumes affect the cereal grain. So it means that we have a lower cereal grain in the intercrop compared to that in the soil crop. So if we have a lower yield for the cereal, but the same amount of nitrogen available, this means there is more nitrogen available for each uh, kilograms of grain producing intercrop. And that explains why we are increasing the cereal grain protein concentrations. Also in this figure, we observe that the interest of intercropping is mostly when we have low or limited uh, soil crop cereal grain protein content. In that case, the increase in the grain protein concentration is much higher compared to what we have uh, when we uh, are, are in a situation with very high grain protein concentration in the soil crop cereal. I think that you have all the explanation of these processes in the previous talk, so I will not go deeper in that. Um, also, we know that intercropping is a way to reduce uh, weeds, mostly uh, weeds compared to soil crops legumes, we are not very competitive crops. 
We also know that in some cases, in most cases, uh, intercrops can also reduce uh, disease or some uh, pests, but not all pests and not all diseases. But again, this is not the, the topic uh, of my talk. So, what is interesting to notice is that intercrops, in fact, is very old practice. It has been uh, developed uh, a thousand years ago when the first uh, humans start to make farming because at that time they didn't know how to grow soil crops. And uh, now, in, uh, if you have a broad view of the world production, there are some countries where uh, intercrop is still very well developed, like in China, where it has been assumed that more than 25% of the surfaces are mixed crops. While this practice has been uh, uh, forgotten is less and less developed in industrial countries or let's say in countries with uh, very intensive agriculture like uh, European countries and France. And this is due to the simplification of agriculture, meaning that farmers are growing less diversified cropping system with only few species covering most of the surfaces. And this is again due to the intensification of practices. And now a French farmer, for instance, who is managing on average 130 hectares. So the bigger the farm, the, the, the lower the diversity on the farm. It is more difficult to manage a lot of uh, crops. So farmers get used to have very simplified practices and uh, with uh, only a limited number of, uh, of uh, cross species. And that is one of the reasons why intercropping is not disappearing, but less and less cultivated in our uh, context. So it, it, it's important to try to understand why farmers are growing less intercrops. This is due to some locking factors and uh, some difficulties. First of all, there is uh, difficulties for commercialization. This means when a farmer wants to grow intercrops, it is not always very easy to sell it to collectors because collectors are used to collect all wheat, or pea, or fabadin, or maize, or whatever, but not crop mixtures. And the reason for that is that usually they have to uh, separate the grains because for human consumption, the market needs uh, wheat, or pea, or fabadin, or maize, or whatever, but doesn't need crop mixtures. And uh, when we have to separate the grains, it means that there is a risk of contamination, perhaps in the wheat, if the wheat has been grown with fababin, probably you will find some fababin residues in the wheat, which will affect the process of transformation of uh, wheat grains into bread, for, for example. Also, for collectors, if each farmer is, is growing uh, one kind of intercrop, it makes the collect more complex. So they have to um, try that farmers grow only a few kinds of crop mixtures, and they need to have end of farmers growing one kind of mixture to fill their, um, their tanks and to be able to commercialize these uh, crop mixtures. So this is the first difficulties for farmers who want to grow is how to sell the crop mixtures. But also for them, there is a lot of difficulties. Since uh, intercrops has been less and less developed years after years, farmers lose some part of their knowledge on this crop mixture. And now when a farmer wants to grow a crop mixture, he not necessarily know which kind of species it can grow together, which cultivars. He doesn't know how to make the sowing, means when he has to make sowing of the two species, at which density, which uh, row patterns, uh, how to fertilize. Uh, the, is that uh, because he know how to fertilize the wheat, he knows that legumes doesn't need any fertilization, but what about the crop mixture? And if we talk about pesticide use, it's which kind of uh, chemicals are allowed on intercrops and how to use them, how to harvest the crop mixture, and do they will benefit from any uh, subsidies. So we understand that there is a lot of possibilities to um, combine spaces and to grow crop mixtures, but we have to propose efficient and acceptable solution, not only for farmers, but also taking into account the commercialization and after that, the transformation of the grains into uh, products. So the question is that 
Is that uh, agroecological practices can be adopted? And if yes, how? So in order uh, agroecological practices or let's say new practices to be adopted, it needs to be uh, efficient solutions for low input systems. So we know that there is some efficient, innovative solution, but we have to spray this knowledge to uh, all uh, the actors. We also know that there is a social request to find the solution. People want to have uh, less uh, agricultural practices uh, with less impact on the environment. Uh, and um, so we observe that actors, farmers, collectors, and so on, are integrating slowly this innovation. And this integration is a little bit slow because of the actual organization of the supply chain is well structured and well stable because it has been built years after years since decades. So the question is is that farming systems locked? And if yes, why? And how to switch from the conventional practices to a more agroecological paradigm? So there is two ways to change the practices. Or, or it is a market-driven incentives. So this means it is a market it's because consumers want a new product or a more ecological product that this will uh, ask the supply chain to change and then farmers to change their practices. And the other way is farmers-driven incentives. So it means farmers change their practice, this affects the supply chain, and then this leads to a new products and change into the market. So both are possible, and usually both are uh, done at the same time, but sometimes one is more uh, uh, efficient than the other one to change the practices. So how does the lock-in effect uh, works? So I will take the example of the QWERTY keyboard. This QWERTY keyboard or Asiatic keyboard has been designed a long time ago in 1817 by Scholz and Leiden in order to prevent tiger clashes. And it is quite funny to see that uh, even today with our new computers, our smartphone, we are still using this QWERTY keyboard. So this is because one choice has been made, another choice has been made at uh, time t0, and because of the choice made earlier, the choice remains the dominant in, uh, in now. And um, even if some alternatives exist, like for example, perhaps you know about the drawback keyboard, it is a keyboard which must be more efficient because we have a, a different distribution of uh, letters on the keyboard. But almost no one is using this kind of keyboard because when you buy your computer, you have not the choice into the keyboard. And also because you have been trained on using a QWERTY keyboard, so you don't want to learn a new keyboard. So because we made an earlier choice, now alternative or more difficult to, uh, to, to be adopted. And this reveals the past dependency. And uh, this past dependency is reinforced by self-reinforcing mechanism, like the supply chain organization, the fact that if we want to change from one practice to another practice, there is a cost, it could be a knowledge cost or an economical cost. There is sometimes a lack of knowledge, so people don't know about this uh, drawback keyboard or about uh, new agroecological practices. So there is an uncertainty about the efficiency and the results that they can expect from the systems. Sometimes the government doesn't support any changes, or conversely, the uh, government can support the changes and make it uh, easy to move from one system to another system. So there is a lot of factors that explain why it is difficult to move from conventional to more agroecological practices. And if we want to resume this, is that a technology is not chosen because it is the best one, but it became the best one because it has been chosen earlier. And this is clearly the example of the QWERTY keyboard. It's not, it's not now uh, the most efficient system, but it is the most used system because it has been developed a long time ago and people have been used to, uh, to this uh, practice. And this I like the fact that once a solution is reached, it is difficult, more or less difficult, to exit from, and this reveals what we call the lock-in problem. So, in the case of intercrops, 
as I, I said before, um, one of the key factors is, is commercialization and the fact that many collectors don't, don't accept uh, crop mixtures. And we made a study with some economics uh, colleagues on um, the acceptability of collectors for uh, grain mixtures. And we get some interesting results. First, we observed that the collectors were most... Um, the, the acceptability of intercross by collectors depend on the way they manage the quality. And I mean, uh, it is, depends on the competencies and technical means. For example, if a collector has material to separate the grains, is able to make different batches based on the quality of the products, it means is able to manage the quality. While if we compare the collector able to make 10 different classes of wheat, depending on the grain quality, depending on the grain size, on grain color, on grain protein content, whatever, is more easy for him to manage a new crop like intercrop mixtures compared to a collector who has only one tank where he put all the wheat. So this knowledge about how to manage different batches makes a collector more or less sensitive to collect intercrops. We also observe that the size of the collector is not a discriminating factor. Uh, this means that it is not because the collector is very big, collecting a lot of uh, grains, that it will not accept crop mixtures. It really depends on the way it's managing uh, the, the quality. So if we want to develop intercrops, at least we need to find enough farmers growing intercrops, and if not, collectors will not collect crop mixtures. Also, we need to uh, uh, guide farmers to grow specific kind of crop mixtures, because in order to have enough grains of each kind of mixture in order to be able to separate and to commercial, uh, the, commercialize the grains. Also, collectors need to be able to uh, separate the grains and obviously to have a market for the two grains. If a collector uh, wants to collect wheat and pea, he needs to uh, develop previously a market for the wheat and a market for the pea. Or if he doesn't have markets, he will uh, choose or he will develop only a few kinds of crop mixtures. And the fact that the supply chain is quite locked is because on the top of the chain, or bottom, depending on which way you look at the chain, we have a lot of consumers, a lot of buyers, and on the other side, a lot of farmers. But in the middle, we have only few actors who buy the grains, few industrials. And because of these few numbers of people, it is them who, who can uh, block the system and uh, prevent the development of alternative practices. So one of the key problems for the development of intercrops is the effectiveness of grain separation. Indeed, the fact that we, if we are able or not to separate the grains, will determine the gross margin efficiency. A few years ago, we made an experiment with one collector with a simple separating machine with different tanks with different uh, grade uh, size. And we tried to separate a mixture composed of 65% of wheat, 23% of pea, some impurities and some broken peas. After one pass in this uh, grain separation, we observed that we are able to uh, separate the, to clean the pea, because in the clean pea we have 90% wheat pea, only 1% of wheat remaining, and few impurities. And since the pea go for animal consumption, this quality is good enough. But conversely, after one pass into the wheat, we have 85% of wheat, but we find in this wheat most of the impurities and all the broken beans. And in this case, the wheat is not clean enough to be sold for human consumption. So we could conclude from this that, okay, it is not possible to separate the grains, and then it's not possible to commercialize a crop mixture, so there is no interest to grow crop mixture. But it's not so easy. Yeah, definitely sorting out grains is uh, something difficult, and but we have some options that we can develop.
So this was uh, an example of a new uh, sorting machine which has been developed by a company Dennis and uh, which is uh, one of the actors who uh, belongs to the European Product Remix. And this separating machine is able to separate at least two species with different levels and uh, the efficiency of this uh, separator is much higher than the previous one. So we can develop even more efficient machines like optical sorters able to recognize the grains by the size, their color, their shape or whatever. And, but obviously the more efficient the system, the more costly it is. So it is not all farmers can buy an optical sorter because it's very expensive, but they can share it between different farmers. But also we can, if we don't, or if we are not able to invest in more efficient uh, system, we can try to think how to separate grains differently. First of all, if it's a collector, we, we want to separate the grains, the collector will collect a huge volume of grains. So we need to have a system, um, we need to have non-homogeneous uh, crop mixtures in order to be able to uh, use this uh, separating machine. Conversely, on farm, we assume that farmers could have more time to dedicate to grain separation, more time to adapt the adjustments of the grain separation to the batches, and then it would be more easier for him to, to, to clean the grains. And perhaps he will not try to clean the grains in one pass, but perhaps in two pass or three passes. Obviously, it is time costly, and not all farmers want to, uh, to separate grains because it is another job. It's not only putting the grain to the machine, press a button and separate the grain. If you want to separate the grain, and you can see here on the picture on the top right part, it's a farmer who dedicates a lot of time in grain separation. And to do that, he has a lot of, uh, of grids able to separate each kind of grains. And uh, he says that separating grains is really a new job. But also there is possibility that farmers work together and can employ someone to separate the grains. Another way is also after separating, sometimes one of the batches, like the wheat previously, is not good enough for human consumption because there is too much impurities. But the idea is that the farmers will not grow only crop mixture in his farm. He will have crop mixture, but also soil crop wheat. So perhaps he can dilute the impurities of the wheat uh, from uh, intercrops with uh, wheat from the soil crop field. And doing that, it can improve the quality, the grain protein concentration of the batches, and reduce the impurities. But perhaps also we can uh, try to separate differently. What we have said is that uh, when we try to separate wheat pea, for example, there is always a part of wheat and a part of pea which is easy to separate. But at the end, it's very difficult to remove the broken peas, small pieces of broken peas from the wheat. So perhaps when we want to separate a crop mixture, the idea is to try to separate what is easy to separate and what is remaining, we can sell it for animal consumption instead of trying to separate everything using very uh, costly uh, machines. And also to be able to separate the grains, we have to think about which kind of crop mixture. Some crop mixture are more easy to separate and others with it, and for some crop mixture, it's definitely impossible to separate the grains because they are exactly the same shape, exactly the same size. And like, for example, if you mix two cereals, it's almost impossible to separate barley from a, a wheat. And this brings us to uh, the choice of cultivars more easy to separate. For instance, uh, bees are not sensitive to, uh, to split into two parts or wheat easy to stretch. Like that, we can adapt the harvest of the crop mixtures. So, on this video, it was just an example of a harvest of a crop mixture and made by the group ACO, which is again one of the partners of the Remix project. So in this case, we use a very classic combiner. We could have the idea of designing a new combiner, like kind of a double combiner, able to 
uh, harvest the two crops and directly separate them on the field. But definitely the development of this kind of machine is too costly and there is not a market for this kind of double combiner. So our idea is not to try to design new machine, even if as a proof of concept it is possible to design this kind of machine, but we know that uh, companies who sell this kind of machine will not do this. So the idea is more to understand how a combiner works and how can we optimize the settings. And in the, the bottom, we see one of our colleagues, Alistair Morrison, optimizing the settings of the combiner to harvest uh, wheat favaline. And on the picture on the right, uh, we have uh, one on the right which has been optimized with very uh, few broken faba bean. And in the middle, we have a mixture with a lot of wheat and a lot of uh, broken faba beans. So definitely, if we uh, use adapted settings for the combiners, we will not break all the faba beans, and then we will not have a lot of uh, small parts of faba bean to remove from the wheat. And unfortunately, when we try to harvest a wheat faba bean, the settings of the combiner for the wheat is widely different from the setting of the faba bean. So we have to find a good compromise. And the compromise is not the average settings of each species. And uh, now we observe that um, uh, farmers who want to grow intercrops, they have to take time on optimizing the settings of their combiner. And, um, and this is not an easy task because it's easy to harvest a crop with a combiner, but most of the farmer doesn't know exactly how the combiner works and we have to train farmers to know better their machines in order to adapt uh, the combiner settings. Also, some farmers, they don't uh, harvest uh, the crop mixture themselves. They ask to uh, another company to do that job. And these kind of companies, they want to harvest very fast and don't want to spend a lot of time on adapting the settings. But if we want to grow into crops, in order, in, if we want to separate the grains, we have to take care when we harvest the grain because the harvest quality drives the ability to separate the grains later. So this was from the farmer's point of view and taking uh, considering that we want to separate the grains. But perhaps in other situation, it's not possible to separate the grains, or perhaps we can find solutions for which we don't have to separate the grains. And uh, in a previous project, the Giorgio project, the French project, we work with uh, industrial to redesign the processing, for example, for couscous production, but also to uh, propose uh, biscuits made of a mixture of uh, cereals and legumes. And this, uh, we can produce biscuits, but we can also produce a spaghetti made of a lentil wheat mixture, or faba bean wheat mixture, or chickpea wheat mixtures. Obviously, all these products are not good, so this means that we have to design good products for consumers, but others are uh, very tasty and then we don't have to separate the grains, or at least the separation would be much easier. So the development of intercrops is not only a fact uh, for farmers, but it also has consequences on collectors and later on industry. And at the end of the chain, it also has consequences for consumers. And remember my uh, first chart when I showed that there is a market-driven or farmers-driven innovation. So consumers can make things change. If consumers want to buy this kind of uh, pasta made, uh, spaghetti made with uh, faba bean or chickpea or lentil flour, this will have consequences on the farmer's production. But unfortunately, when we ask people uh, what is the first criteria for purchasing food is the price. So if we develop products more costly because we have to separate uh, grains with costly machines or uh, needs to have um, more costly for food production for food industry, well, uh, people will perhaps uh, not uh, buy this kind of products. Also, most of the people, they buy food in supermarkets, so we need to, uh, to, to, to 
provide this kind of product to supermarkets. And perhaps um, it's also, yeah, for me, it's an idea of uh, how to educate people and to explain how we produce uh, products. And perhaps uh, by cooking at home, it will uh, make people more open to new products. And uh, perhaps we have to, uh, yeah, to, to, to spray all this kind of knowledge. And uh, I wanted to, to conclude my talk by an illustration, which is producing organic lentil with wheat. And um, in south of France, there is a growing interest in organic lentil. And just for example, one of the collectors in our area was growing 23 hectares of lentil in 2011 and 216 hectares in uh, 2016. Because of this uh, growing interest in organic lentil, they made investment in grain separation and also they created their own brand named Monbio in order to, uh, to develop the production of lentil. But the, the matter is that uh, they observe that uh, lentil production is low and unstable because it's very sensitive to weeds, also to breaches and also to lodging. So they wanted to find a solution. So we worked together uh, with a PhD student and we observe that mixing lentil with uh, wheat can remove or at least reduce the weeds, reduce the lodging, but has no effect on bridges, unfortunately. And because of that, now 75% of the lentils collected by Calisol is produced in crop mixture with wheat. And you have a picture of a lentil, a salt crop lentil, which is very low, 15 to 25 meter, centimeter height. While the intercrop lentil is 25 to 35 centimeters, it makes the harvest much easier. And in that case, separating the grains is not a problem because all the lentil are separated with optical machine. And in that case, we can use this kind of optical separation because lentil is a very expensive crop. When it is clean, it's, sell, uh, it's been sold to 1,500 euros per ton. So in that case, we can use expensive separators. While if we are growing a wheat pea, uh, these two crops are not very expensive crops, so we cannot use this kind of optical separation. So this is that if we want to develop alternative practices such as crop mixtures, it is not only a problem of farmers or collectors or the industrial or consumer. We have all to work together, and also it is not only developing intercrops, it's trying to develop different practices altogether. And the idea is not to ask farmers to only grow crop mixtures, but to grow crop mixtures and salt crops. And all this will give a higher spatial diversification and temporal diversification. And this kind of uh, topics, it has been developed in the European Project Remix. And um, you can have a look to our web pages to learn more about this crop mixture. So thank you for your attention. and. Um, Hope we'll have some uh, interaction later. Bye.